All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 29, Contesting Futures, America in the 1960s. We'll be looking at Section 1, the Kennedy Promise. So last chapter, Chapter 28, we talked mostly about the 1950s. In this chapter here, 29, we'll be focusing on the next decade, the 1960s. So one thing to keep in mind about the 1950s is that it was certainly a decade of conformity. That means to, uh, you know, pretty much to adhere to the social norms. And we saw this in a lot of different ways, whether that was, you know, this very sort of strong anti-communist sentiment inside the United States, but also with consumer culture uh, things like television, you know, this was a time where television was becoming increasingly available to Americans, but there wasn't a wide variety of uh, programs that people could watch. Um, the consumer uh, culture of the decade uh, also is characterized by, you know, home building like Levitt towns where everybody lived in the same house. So you had a culture of the 1950s where essentially everybody was watching the same TV shows, they were living in houses that were built identical to one another, watching the same advertisements, buying the same products. So it was uh, you know, certainly a decade of uh, material wealth, right? We might wanna say that as well. There was a lot of material wealth, but uh, again, a lot of conformity when it came to culture. The 1960s kind of challenges that, and nobody better represents it than John F. Kennedy. Uh, John F. Kennedy was a young, uh, well, he had served in, in public office. I, I believe he was a senator prior to becoming president, but he was a youthful, optimistic candidate for president in the 1960 election. So 1960 presidential election, John F. Kennedy, who you see pictured right here and right here, who kind of gives this picture of optimism and youthfulness. He was kind of like a breath of fresh air. It was sort of a new course for the United States when he ran for president. Uh, a little bit of background about him. He came from a very wealthy family. He had served in World War II and was known for being, in some respects, a war hero. He served in the Navy. He, uh, you know, there were stories about how he rescued some of his fellow servicemen uh, while in the war. At the same time, even though he gave this appearance of optimism and youthfulness and of energy, uh, he was actually hurt during the war. And, you know, physically speaking, even though on the outside he looked like a very energetic type of person, he suffered from, uh, you know, some of the injuries that he had gone through during World War II. He was also unlike any other president before him in that he was a Catholic. And in fact, when the 1960 presidential election was held, he was running against Richard Nixon. So Richard Nixon running against Kennedy. Uh, Richard Nixon had been a, uh, he was a congressman from California. He had gained notoriety really as a cold warrior. He was very active in rooting out communists in the 1950s. He was vice president to President Eisenhower. So he had the, uh, you know, he certainly had the experience. Meanwhile, he's running against the guy here in Kennedy who was young. Uh, Nixon labeled him as naive that the Soviet Union would eat somebody like Kennedy alive because he didn't have the right experience for the job. Meanwhile, Nixon, uh, again, you know, had probably the most relevant experience being the vice president and, you know, having a long uh, time in politics as a cold warrior, you know, really going against communism. But in the 1960 presidential election, the debate between Nixon and Kennedy was significant because it was the first televised debate. And in that debate, you had it broadcasted on TV, and then you also had it broadcasted on radio. And in that debate, Kennedy, at least visually, um, was able to uh, really kind of show Americans that he was presidential. He had good, um, you know, sort of like body posture and body language. And, you know, he was a handsome guy, very attractive. And so people were more drawn to that. Meanwhile, 
You know, Nixon was very fidgety. He had poor posture. And so when the, uh, when the debate was held between Kennedy and Nixon, those who were watching on TV thought that Kennedy had won the debate, but those who were listening on the radio believed that Nixon had won the debate because he had the better answers. But, you know, this was a sign of the times, and the times is, well, more and more Americans are coming to own televisions, and television is becoming kind of the main, the main way that people absorb information, advertisements, programs, culture, whatever you want to call it. And in a very, very, very close election, John F. Kennedy won the 1960 presidential election. And so this was kind of a new step for the country. Uh, during his inauguration, he gave, uh, you know, of course, probably one of the most more noteworthy uh, speeches or at least lines um, where Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. All right, ask what you can do for your country. All right, that's part of his inauguration. And uh, so when it came to the Cold War, now recall the Cold War is still going on, right? This is the ideological struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. You know, the Cold War goes roughly from 1949 to 19, well, we'll say 1945 to about 1989-ish. So, you know, in pretty much all of these chapters uh, remaining in U.S. history, the Cold War is still going on in the background. And because Kennedy was attacked for being naive, he really felt kind of a, a pressure, you might say, to aggressively pursue a Cold War policy. There's really no departure between Kennedy and, and his predecessors. For the most part, most U.S. presidents all throughout the Cold War have a very anti-communist stance. Um, but there were some unique ways maybe that Kennedy fought the Cold War. One was what we call the space race, and this is the technological competition between the U.S. and Soviet Union. Remember, the Cold War is to convince the rest of the world which idea or ideology is better. Is capitalism and democracy better or is communism better? And one of the ways to prove that is by saying, look, uh, one system can provide us with technological advancements. You know, which ideology is going to bring us the first man in space, which one is going to bring us the first man on the moon. And so by competing in this technological arena, uh, both the United States and the Soviet Union turned towards space and space exploration. The Soviets were winning or did win the space rates at first. Yuri uh, Gagarin, he is a, what we call a cosmonaut. Cosmonaut? Maybe I got that wrong. Um, but he's a Soviet astronaut. I think it's a cosmonaut anyways. Uh, but he was the first man in space. He was from the Soviet Union. In the last chapter, we talked about the launch of the very first satellite, which was Sputnik. Again, this was a Soviet satellite. So the space race was um, you know, certainly something that the Soviets were ahead of the Americans on. When Kennedy was elected, he made a promise that by the end of the decade, that by 1970, the U.S. would reach the moon. In other words, a man on the moon. And this was uh, kind of like Kennedy's commitment to the space rights, that more and more funding and more and more effort would go into improving technology to prove to the rest of the world that the United States has a better system than what the Soviet has. Uh, this investment in programs like NASA, for example, led to a lot of new industries and led to a lot of new internal migrations. The Sun Belt refers to the area in the U.S. where the sun shines, right? So we're talking about places like Florida, Texas. California, right? So these are areas which have, we typically think of having very, very nice weather. Uh, all of this investment into the space race had created new jobs in these areas. And so you had various industries associated with space flight, with other sort of, uh, you know, engineering industries. 
and they were building in these Sun Belt states. And so uh, because there were more jobs in Florida, Texas, and California, that meant that people moved, so migrations. And this is a uh, population shift that you begin to see, or not really begin, but a population trend in the United States, especially after World War II and into the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. That is people moving away from the Midwest, which was typically kind of the industrial center of the US, and moving more towards the Sun Belt. So much so that, you know, by today, the states that are the most populated in the United States include states like Florida, Texas, and California. And some of that was because of the new jobs that were available related to industries in the space race. Uh, Kennedy also fought the Cold War on different fronts. The Alliance for Progress, uh, this was funds for Latin America. The idea is that a strong capitalist economy is the best safeguard against uh, what you might say the uh, the tempting of communism. So give more money to Latin America to build stronger economies to resist communism. Uh, the Peace Corps still exists today. It is a program in which young Americans, typically young Americans, I don't know if you have to be young, uh, Americans, do humanitarian work in what we call third world countries. A third world country is a country that is not allied with the Soviet Union, not allied with the United States, is potentially up for grabs in the Cold War. And so the, the purpose of the Peace Corps is to take young Americans, go to these nations, provide humanitarian effort, uh, and that way, you know, those countries have a much better impression of the United States. Uh, it helps wins, win the hearts and minds. That's a term that you should be familiar with, hearts and minds. And that was the objective of the Cold War. How do you convince the rest of the world to, uh, you know, adopt your ideology? And the Peace Corps was one way of doing that. Kennedy was also more willing to be flexible with the Soviet Union. This was much more unlike... Eisenhower. Remember, Eisenhower was the massive retaliation, so he's a little bit more uh, willing, I guess you could say, in order to uh, you know be flexible with the Soviet Union. And then, of course, counterinsurgencies typically refers to the actions of organizations like the CIA, and that is to use kind of the dirty tricks or the secret tricks, if you will, to undermine communist governments around the world and prop up anti-communist gov governments around the world. Uh, so there are diff a couple of different ways in which Kennedy seeks to battle the Cold War. However, the most notable confrontation occurs in Cuba. And in fact, during the entire Cold War, what happens in Cuba in the 1960s during Kennedy's presidency is probably the closest that the Soviet Union and the United States got to an all out war. Now, the reason we call this war the Cold War as opposed to a hot war is because no direct fighting actually took place between the Soviets and the Americans. In Cuba, it got pretty close. So up until 1959, Cuba had a pro-American regime. However, that regime was overthrown by Fidel Castro, who uh, initiated what's called the Cuban Revolution and did so in the name of a communist government and with Soviet support. Because again, this is the Cold War. So if there's any person out there or any faction that opposes the United States, the Soviet Union's gonna support them and you know, vice versa. This happened at the very end of Eisenhower's administration and he really didn't do a lot about it. And so this was maybe like the first thing that Kennedy had to deal with by the time that he had, had assumed the presidency. This was especially alarming because not only have the United States been losing the technological race, the space race up until this point, but it had also lost China, which had turned communist. Um, and many people believe that Korea actually wasn't a, a victory for the US. So in terms of the Cold, Cold War front, it didn't look like the United States was in a very good position. And especially when Cuba turned communist, it was the first country in the Western hemisphere to adopt a communist regime. It proved that the Atlantic Ocean was not gonna say, uh, provide sort of like a safeguard or barrier against uh, communism. And so uh, Kennedy's response to this was to initiate what's called the Bay of Pigs invasion. This was an invasion by the CIA 
that would take uh, what we might call maybe anti Castro, uh, anti Castro, anti Fidel Castro Cubans, arm them, train them, land them at the Bay of Pigs, and hopefully start an anti Castro revolution. Now, the thing about the Bay of Pigs is that this is done secretly, right? The idea is that the United States does not want to involve itself openly. It's going to use the CIA. It's going to be secret. It's going to train Cubans themselves, right? You know, so these are anti-Castro Cubans. These are not American forces. These are people who fled Cuba when Castro came to power uh, to not provoke the Soviet Union, right? That's the idea. This attempted invasion, this attempted overthrow of Fidel Castro, the communist leader, uh, fails, and it fails miserably. In fact, the Cuban revolutionaries are captured, and it creates somewhat of a greater crisis than before. Uh, so things are pretty tense between Cuba and the United States as a result of this failed Bay of Pigs invasion. Fidel Castro goes to the premier of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, so he is the premier how do you spell M-I-E-R, premier of Soviet Union. He follows Stalin, so Stalin's dead in 1953. Khrushchev becomes the next premier. Uh, Fidel Castro goes to Nikita Khrushchev, says the Americans are essentially trying to overthrow me. Can you help? Khrushchev and the Soviet Union begin to construct ballistic missile sites in Cuba as a way to safeguard Cuba against any further American aggression. These ballistic missile sites are discovered by the United States. Here is a uh, aerial view of what the United States found out. And uh, this was unacceptable. The fact that the Soviets were putting missiles so close to the US that were within striking range of Washington DC and striking range of you know New York City, a lot of the East Coast. And the fear was that the Soviets could launch a first strike attack without giving the United States enough time to respond. So Kennedy went on television, ordered a naval quarantine of Cuba, and demanded that the Soviets take the missiles down. The Soviet Union essentially refused, and you had this standoff in 1962 between the Soviets and the Americans, neither side really willing to back down. We call this brinksmanship. Brinksmanship is like the diplomacy in which neither side will back down. And it was a very scary time. You know, the, there was a, a belief for, you know, two weeks or so, both in the United States and in the Soviet Union, that a nuclear war would erupt between these two nations because neither side really wanted to back down. However, beside the, uh, behind the scenes, Robert Kennedy, who was John F. Kennedy's brother, and I believe the Attorney General, was creating a compromise, and the two sides did find a compromise, so no war was had. The compromise said to remove missiles from Cuba, which the Soviet Union did. The U.S. was to remove missiles in the country of Turkey, which was uh, kind of like Cuba, very close to the Soviet Union, and since the United States had missiles there, they could strike the Soviet Union quickly. So it was a trade-off, right? The Soviets get rid of the missiles in Cuba. The United States gets rid of the missiles in Turkey. Uh, they installed a hotline. This was a direct communication between the U.S. and Soviet Union. So if any future crisis emerged, uh, the president of the United States and you know, the premier of the Soviet Union could contact each other directly to avoid conflict. Because you know, especially in this nuclear era, uh, there wasn't a lot of time to react if somebody picked up, let's say, you know, some sort of strange occurrence on a radar or something like that. So this, um, this crisis over Cuba in which the United States and Soviets nearly used nuclear weapons against one another was Again, probably perhaps the closest that the two sides got to a war 
and uh, Kennedy's ability to diffuse it really earned him a lot of uh, credit, I would say, in the eyes of not just Americans, but also people around the world. Neither side really looked like they were you know, backing down to the other one as a result of this. Now, another very important area, and we'll talk about this more in another chapter, is Vietnam. Uh, we talked a little bit about it before, but it's going to be one of the centers for U.S. Cold War policy um, in the late 1960s, so not quite yet. Vietnam is a or was a country in Southeast Asia. It had been in the 1800s, probably to about 1945. It had been controlled by France during World War II from 19, oops, say 19, we'll say 1941. Actually, no, it's 1940. Uh, it belonged to France. France had colonized it, kind of like the U.S. colonized the Philippines. From 1940 to 1945, it belonged to Japan. Japan took it over during World War II. And then from 1945 to about 1950, uh, we'll say four, uh, France had attempted to reconquer Vietnam. And the U.S. supported France's decision to do this. Um, because France was a very important Cold War ally. And so Kennedy comes to power with, you know, uh, U.S. support of France. Those fighting against French occupation is Ho Chi Minh. He is a Vietnamese nationalist. And because he is fighting against France, which is a U.S. ally, right, we can already guess who is supporting Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh, which is a Vietnamese nationalist group. And what the Viet Minh want is an independent Vietnam. Right? They don't want France to rule it. They don't want Japan to rule it. They don't want France to rule it you know, like before. You know, they want to see Vietnam become an independent country. France is trying to make it a colony once again. Uh, and so Ho Chi Minh, of course, you know, like I said, the United States is supporting France. Who's going to support then Ho Chi Minh? Well, it's going to be the Soviet Union. It's going to be China. Uh, so Ho Chi Minh is both a nationalist and a communist. And so you begin to see the battle lines of the, of the Vietnam War, a conflict in which the United States will become much more heavily involved a little bit later on. But Kennedy continued support of the anti-communist side in Vietnam. France gave up on their effort to recolonize Vietnam in 1954. And when they withdrew, they divided Vietnam along the 17th parallel. The North would go to Ho Chi Minh and would be under communist rule. The South, capitalist would fall under the rule of No Dinh Diem, so leader of South Vietnam, and would get US support, right? Would get US support. Uh, the Geneva Accords, which of course is what France signed when they exited, said that there would be elections held. And the elections would unite North and South. Whoever won, if the communists won, well, then all of Vietnam would become communist. If the capitalists won, well, then all of Vietnam would become capitalist. That what, that's what was agreed upon at the Geneva Accords. However, No Dinh Diem, the leader of South Vietnam, recognized that Ho Chi Minh was likely going to win this election. And so he canceled the elections. So this 30, uh, what do you call it, the 17th parallel, which had been a temporary divide between North Vietnam and South Vietnam, and again, the elections were supposed to unite it, No Din Diem, with US support, canceled those elections. And this sparked off the beginnings of a guerrilla conflict. The National Liberation Front, or NLF, referred to by the United States as the Viet Cong, uh, began a campaign against No Din Diem. So we might call this a military campaign right, against DM, uh, and really in support, I'll scroll down here, of Ho Chi Minh, oops, and the communists. 
All right, that's what the NLF is doing. Uh, and President Kennedy, uh, like President Eisenhower before him, uh, supported Diem, except Diem was also, you know, he was uh, an authoritarian, right? And he was uh, very repressive against his own population, which only sparked more support for him. Uh, eventually, no Din Diem was assassinated in 1963, and rule of South Vietnam essentially went to the military which was controlled or being used by the United States. By the time that Kennedy was assassinated, we'll get to that in a second, uh, the United States had 16,000 troops in South Vietnam um, supporting the No Din, uh, Din Diem regime and fighting against the National Liberation Front. And we'll get back to Vietnam again in a little bit here. Um, but anyways, another important thing about Kennedy in his short presidency, only three years, was the changes made to civil rights. Now, we've already talked about in the previous chapter some major accomplishments of the civil rights movements in the 1950s. Kennedy, though, was somebody who initially was not maybe as sympathetic to the civil rights movement, but eventually changed his position as events unfolded. One thing that Kennedy realized and recognized was that, uh, you know, in order to fight the Cold War, to win the hearts and minds of people across the world, that the way that the United States treated African Americans, especially in the South, was not good for its image. And so the fact that the United States claimed to be a you know, country of liberty and for the values of democracy, yet denied so many black people the right to vote at home, it wasn't good for the Cold War. In fact, some of the best and most effective propaganda the Soviet Union used was to point out this contradiction right, on race, specifically in the US. So Kennedy recognized that in order to win the Cold War, that you need to solve the issue of civil rights. You can't win the hearts and minds of people in Africa if you don't treat you know, African-Americans at home equally and give them equal rights like their white counterparts. And so he was very tentative at first because many Southern Democrats opposed civil rights. So again, Kennedy was trying to walk this line between making sure that he can get votes from those Southerners who were against civil rights, um, but also coming to a position that was much more sympathetic to it. The Civil Rights Act of 1960 is one example of, um, of one of these laws that was passed uh, under Kennedy. The more important one is the Civil Rights of 1964. I believe this uh, right here, this one, Civil Rights Act of 1960, this had to do with voting and voting rights for African Americans. But the point under which Kennedy really kind of made his um, uh, support known was the case of James Meredith. He was the first black man to attend, uh, I wanna say, what was it, Mississippi? Old Miss? I don't know exactly, Mississippi. University. And uh, similar to what Eisenhower had gone through in the uh, Little Rock crisis, James Meredith, it was ruled by the Supreme Court that in institutions of higher education, there was no segregation. James Meredith attempted to enroll at Mississippi, Mississippi. Um, and uh, there were massive crowds that turned out to oppose him. John F. Kennedy, like Eisenhower before him, sent in uh, federal troops. And this was a way of making sure that the Supreme Court uh, decision was upheld. You can kind of see these tough looking guys escorting James Meredith. Uh, Kennedy then went to Congress and asked for civil rights legislation that would eventually become the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We'll talk more about that in a second here. However, Kennedy never witnessed the civil rights legislation that he passed for because he was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. Uh, he was there in 1963 for his re-election campaign. He was in an open motorcade vehicle, Lee, Har Lee Harvey Oswald, the assassin. Let's picture him right here in the middle. Uh, shot John F. Kennedy in the head, killing him practically right there on the spot. Um, and because Lee Harvey Oswald himself was assassinated later on, um, the death surrounding John F. Kennedy has been really kind of ripe with conspiracy theories. The Warren Commission was set up to investigate the Kennedy 
uh, we'll just say killing. And uh, what the Warren Commission established or ruled was that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone and that these conspiracy theories essentially were bunk. As a result of Kennedy being you know, shot and killed, Lyndon Johnson, the vice president, now became the new president. 